Hi, my name is Paul Ray. Behind me, the, the construction class at LCC, Lane Community College. Um, we are working on a foundation for uh, a former student. We're here in Springfield, Oregon. And we're building a, basically it's a duplex. Technically it is a small house with an attached ADU, accessory dwelling unit. These units uh, in the back is the, actually the home, the initial home. It is 30 by 28, 30 foot long, 28 feet wide. In the front, it's actually 28 by 28. The ADU unit, which is actually attached, has to be a little bit smaller than the initial building. And on this site, uh, behind where I'm, you know, where I'm looking, we're planning on doing, uh, at some point, another duplex back here. It's nice to get the class out here. We're learning how to form up footings, uh, stem wall, we're tying rebar, um, a lot of different components here. This is the footing you're looking at. It is the footprint of the home, hence the name. It's the part that sits on the ground. It's the part that ultimately holds up the building. It's size, you know, the width of it and how thick the concrete, this is gonna be concrete, obviously, um, is dictated by how, how many stories the building is, what kind of soil it's sitting on. I, I, I wanted to mention some of the terminology here. You know, these are two by eight, forms we have for the footing to hold the concrete in place. We've spread those a particular distance apart with what's called a mono strap. This is the mono strap right here. The overall dimension on the mono strap, this one is 19 inches. You know the two by eights are inch and a half wide, inch and a half. I want a 16 inch wide footing. So we just hold it to the outside of the form. On top of those we've got what are called spreader cleats or rapid ties or um, Rappy is a brand name, but we are going to put uh, uh, plywood panels in here, and these are designed to hold the panel in place, keep the panels from spreading when we fill it with concrete. Uh, these spreader cleats will go on the bottom, and they will go on the top of the panel. Before we even put these uh, mono straps on here, we put all the rebar in place, reinforcing bar. Concrete's really good in compression. When you try to squish it, it can resist that. When you try to pull it apart, it, it does not resist that very well. We put re reinforcing bar in there to increase the tensile strength, the pulling apart strength of the concrete. Uh, it needs to be a certain distance off the sides of the footing, certain distance off the ground. We're trying to encapsulate it in as much concrete as possible and keep it away from the elements. When the elements get to the steel rebar, uh, it rusts. When it rusts, it, doesn't, it weakens it and it falls apart. It's called a, a UFER or a grounding rod for the electrical system in the home. It's real common for this to get missed. It needs to be a full length, full 20 foot long piece of uninterrupted bar. That, that, that means you can't take two, two 12 foot pieces and pin them together and call it a 20 foot piece. It has to be one 20 foot piece integrated with all the rest of the rebar. These footings across the middle here are strip footings. They are, you know, ultimately going to be a small wall built on top of them to support the mid-span of the floor joists. That way you can use a little bit smaller profile floor joists and uh, support it in the middle. We've, we've oversized this footing, um, trying to, you know, be mindful that eventually, I mean, a person may, would be able to come to this building and add a, a second story if they wanted to without bolstering the strength of the foundation. I think it increases the value of the home if the foundation is already big enough to, uh, to go up another story if you want. Anyway, footing. On top of this footing we're going to put what's called a stem wall. That's the part of the concrete foundation that gets you out of the ground. Okay. Um, there are rules for how deep in the ground the bottom of this footing needs to be. In Lane County it's 12 inches below finish grade. Okay. So when this foundation is complete, the dirt's going to be shoved up against the foundation. That's what we're shooting for, 12 inches below that finished grade on the outside of the building. Uh, you know, in Bend, that 
that uh, dimension would be 18 inches. In uh, Klamath Falls, it'd be 24. We're trying to get to a point where the earth will never freeze. When the earth freezes, it heaves. We don't want it heaving underneath the foundation. So that's where we're at. We're going to pour a 16 inch wide, 8 inch tall footing. On top of that, we're going to pour an 8 inch wide, 2 foot tall stem wall. It's an inverted T foundation or a crawl space foundation. It's the most common type of foundation utilized in this area. No stem wall on this wall. Down the middle, it does get a stem wall. So we'll have stem wall and we're protruding up from the footing all the way around the perimeter and down the middle. Tuning in where we have uh, got a little bit farther. Eight inch tall footing, 16 inches wide. On top of that footing, ideally centered on the footing, is this stem wall. It's a vertical portion of concrete wall that gets the building out of the dirt, out of the out of the ground. Right? We don't want we don't want wood near or in contact with the, the ground. So we you know, we have to have a certain amount of distance between wood siding, wood building, and the uh, and ground. Six inches. So this is going to be an eight inch wide, two foot tall wall. We use these panels that are made for concrete. They are they have a surface on them that re resists sticking to the concrete. These panels here are almost uh, a laminate, and these are simply made. Uh, they're form ply for for pouring against concrete. They're inch and an eighth thick. They're very strong. We have one more run of rebar that goes at the top of the wall. Um, those vents over there, ventilation is very important for the underfloor. We have plastic vents that we position in the wall, in the forms, I'm sorry, before we pour the concrete. We pour the concrete around them, and there's tricks to that. The idea is today we prepare this, then we call it in for an inspection. The concrete formwork has to be inspected. They are not inspecting typically. Uh, you know whether the formwork will actually work. I mean, they—that's not their job. They're assuring that they are inspecting that the dimensions are what the plan shows they should be, and that the reinforcement is in the concrete in the proper place. You know, tied off where it's not going to move and wiggle and you know what when we try to pour it needs to maintain its position. Uh, and there's rules for that, and that's what they're checking: checking that the vents are in the proper place. Uh, and then you're allowed to pour. You know, sometimes uh, I never thought about it myself, but if you didn't know any better, you'd think, well, maybe they want to inspect the concrete after it's poured to see that it is concrete. Uh, but that is not the case. They want to see what is inside the concrete. Um, we're going to mark where all of the anchor bolts go. Those are what actually tie the building to the foundation. This is a simple home that doesn't have any major hold downs in it, which would be very long, um, curly uh, steel bars that go in there with threads on it and anchor down certain portions of the building. We brought the laser, we'll go around and double check the elevation, make sure everything's good. We will pull a square from corner to corner to ensure that the building is square. Uh, if not, obviously now is the time to fix it. I'm I'm banking on the fact that we're pretty darn good. These are the spreader cleats. They go on top of those mono straps I talked about. They hold the bottom of the panels uh, from moving in or out. Um, we locate them where they need to be with a nice straight line. We went around the entire building and we squared up the building um, and we indicated where those Mo uh, where the rappy ties or spreader cleats needed to go on the mono straps. Fasten them down in a couple places. The panels get positioned in these cleats and then we put cleats on the on the top of the two panels to keep them from moving in or out. Uh, when, they, when this is filled with concrete it wants to push out. Um, so just imagine where you know the concrete is fluid when it shows up. We pour you know we're pouring it from the top of the wall into the footing and it we fill it up as we go we'll probably fill the concrete to about you know this level or so with fairly stiff concrete with a pumper
Gracias. Uh, then we'll go all the way around the parameter doing what I just described then we'll wait a little bit and perhaps uh, Increase the slump of the concrete. We might add a little bit of water to it to loosen it up and we'll top the wall off That means we're filling it up the rest of the way Again, with real um, high slump concrete, meaning it flows really well, it would want to run out that footing. You know, if we tried to fill this all at once, sometimes you can, but usually it would, it would try to run out of the footing. We need to let it set up just for a small short period of time, and then we can top it off. We poured this two days ago. Uh, better to get it stripped before the panel sit any longer. It's easier to get the concrete out. So it went pretty well. No, no major hiccups during the uh, work. Uh, so, you know, question always is, uh, well, how soon can I build on this concrete? Uh, you'd probably want to wait, you know, a few more days before you actually started building on it. It's not supposed to be uh, tested for its strength for at least a week or so. It's plenty hard to be pulling the panels off. Could have pulled the panels off uh, the next day, and that would have been fun. When we talk about concrete uh, strength, you know, that, that's one part of it. Uh, it, concrete strength builds over a period of time. I think it takes almost a month for it to achieve its uh, almost the strength that it's rated at. Um, we delineate concrete strength in PSI, pounds per square inch. It's actually a crushing crushing force. If you took an amount of concrete and squished it, that's the amount of weight it would take before it cracked or failed. Um, we're talking in terms of, I don't know, 2,500 typically to 4,000 maybe PSI on a, on a typical home. Uh, concrete that's exposed to the weather has to be stronger in part so that it can resist the weathering. Uh, where concrete is exposed to water, chances are the water can get in the concrete and freeze. When it freezes, water doesn't care what it's in. It, it expands and it breaks concrete apart. That's why the main reason concrete weathers is water gets in it, it freezes, and you'll notice that if you pay attention. Um, and it isn't a huge problem around here. It doesn't get that cold here. It's a bigger problem in other regions where it does get cold. Anyway, 2,500-pound uh, minimum for concrete uh, footings, stuff that isn't exposed to the weather. I think the stem wall could probably also be 2,500, but I wouldn't do less than three. We ordered this concrete at 3,500. Um, that's just a measure against assuring that it's strong enough even when they have to add a little bit of water to, to make it flow in the wall. So that there are vents placed in the wall. You can see them on that back wall. You need to assure that the concrete flows completely underneath those vents before you keep proceeding. Um, if you don't, you end up with a rock pocket on the back side of the wall where there's a, it's a void where there is no concrete. That's about it for, for now. We'll get the panels off, uh, the footing boards off and cleaned up, panels off and scraped of the mud or the concrete that's on them. Get them loaded up and get them out of here.